Welcome to the new podcast, A Mick, A Mook, and A Mike, hosted by four-time Emmy-nominated producer, Frank Pace, with retired New York City firefighter and Vietnam vet, Billy O'Connor. My brother. My brother Frankie. How's it hanging, pal? How's everything? How's your waggle? My waggle's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Talked ooh, about. Ooh. But what the hell with all that? We got a guest today in studio. In studio, right here. We're very excited to have my good friend, Stephen Peterman, uh, who is the executive producer of Murphy Brown, executive producer of Suddenly Susan, executive producer of Miley Cyrus, Hannah Montana. Welcome, Hannah. Hanna. Hanna. <laughs> the Shtetl version. <laughs> <laughs> Very sophisticated. This Welcome, <laughs> Stephen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> let me let me let me ask you a question before Billy takes over this entire, oh! entire conversation. Okay, you're the second week in a row we've had a Wisconsin native. Who was the Lauren Sesselman, who was from Green Bay, and she was a soccer player on the Canadian National Olympic team. Which explains why she and I didn't bump into each other. Yes. And I, w- I wanted to ask her, you the same thing I asked her. What the hell's going on with Aaron Rodgers? Boy, oh boy. I love Aaron, but <laughs> Aaron is, is like a teenage girl in some ways. And here I am. All right, we're doing ESPN. We're doing hot takes. Um, some of Aaron's complaints are, I think, fully justified. If you look at some of the uh, additions that they made and some of the trades they did and didn't do to to build the team that he needed around in the last few years, you can understand why he'd be pretty upset about it. Um, and, uh, and I think Jordan Love last year was another, like, Jesus Christ, um, thanks a lot for the vote of confidence. And then he has a season like I don't think anybody was expecting to have. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just think um, they're a little tone deaf with him, and he requires a, a lot, lot of care. A lot of <laughs> well, a we lot know of actors care. like that, but you know, it. I do know actors like that, and you, they drive you crazy. But when they're really good, and they give you something nobody else does, and one of the reasons he's so good is because, like, um, like Brady, he came in with a, a chip on his shoulder. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think he's had that chip on his shoulder his whole career and it makes him as good as he is. I don't know. I still think there's a real shot he'll play because he's got and play for the Packers and play for the Packers. He's not writing out a 40 million dollar check to sit out. No, he's not. And it doesn't look like anybody's really rushing to go after him. Uh, I'm hoping he plays and I. It's not, but it, it's it's the same thing that happened with Favre. You don't want him to go out this way mm-hmm. after the career he's had. As a matter of fact, he was at Oakmont, my the place I golf. He was at Oakmont two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. I got a text from one of my friends. Uh, Rogers is here. Rogers is here. You got to come over. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm going to come over to the club and and be a, a seven year old and be a seven year old boy again. I can't, I can't do this. I can't do. This. I'm not going to do it. I stay home. I'm really good. I do so. I vacuum the house for my wife. But all the, all the time you're thinking, thinking about Aaron, Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> <laughs> this is my maturity story. So I don't do anything. Uh, and and it's like, and I get the call at like 10 in the morning. 2.30 in the afternoon, I'm done with everything. I said, I'm going to go over to the club and hit a little bit. He's probably gone by now. Sure you did. I'll go down to the range. Sure. I No, it was closer. It was like 3. I get down there. One of the bag boys says, he's in the card room. Are you going to go in the card room? Yeah, I'm going to walk into the card room like, oh, I'm sorry. I thought this was the bathroom. You know, it's like so (laughs) stupid. (laughs) I'm not going to go down to the card room. So what do I do? I say, I know what I'll do. I need to practice my putting. (laughs) So, you know, the putting green is right where you cross out of the club to head to the parking lot. I'm going to putt. I wound up putting for an hour and a half because he spent a lot of time <laughs> in that in that, uh, in that card room. But when he came out, he walked by me, and I said, hey, whatever happens, it's been great watching you play. And he said, thanks, man. 
So I think I may have tipped him towards, God, Wisconsin people are so nice, I should stay. Good. Because he doesn't have a future in television. No. Because he was awful. I agree. Hosting, hosting Jeff. I agree. He was the worst. I agree. No, he's just stiff. He, he was stiff. And he was, he, was, he was like trying really hard to be a good student. Yeah. You know. I'm surprised. Uh, I'm surprised that nobody really wants to go after him though, because he's still got a lot left. I mean, I his know. arm. Yeah, this, but the price tag. Yeah. They'll go after him, okay? But the, you know, the price tag. Yeah. Uh, I, before, before I let again, before I let Billy take over this. <laughs> so far, you're doing a good job. Yeah. <laughs> Is Kristen Yelich through? Kristen Yelich through? To be honest with you, I left Wisconsin a long time ago. I was a Cubs fan. For years, because when the I was I grew up with the Braves when they were the Milwaukee Braves. Mm -hmm. When they left, uh, I my brother and I became Cubs fans because WGN mm -hmm. blasted them. You know, you could listen to them, mm -hmm. uh, and there we had no other options. Then the uh, the Brewers came in. They were an American League team. I didn't know the American League, so I stayed with the Cubs for years. Then I move out of here, and I'm still a Cubs fan. But then my son is born. And I'm thinking, well, I started I started becoming a Dodgers fan mainly because I was listening to Vin Scully. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to Vin Scully, you become a Dodgers fan. Then my son is born, and I think, am I going to ruin my son's life by making him a Cubs fan? Oh. Or am I going to give him the shot at happiness by making him <laughs> a Dodgers fan? So I gave my son free will, and he became a Dodgers fan. So I became a Dodgers fan. The so, Brewers, my mom loves the Brewers. I know, your mom and your aunt. My mom and my aunt. My, you have researched this. No, I, I spent 30 years with you. Yeah, that's true. You remember stuff. You remember a lot. I do remember a lot. For a, a guy lot. who had some medical issues. I do. I, well, I, you know, and emotional issues. <laughs> emotional, emotional issues. Emotional issues, for sure. <laughs> but, but my you, mom taught me how to score a baseball game. Yeah, and your mom's, well, your aunt's 100? No, uh, my aunt, that's right. Aunt Shirley is 101. Mom is 98. And your, wow. And your aunt. Aunt and your mom threw out the first ball. Aunt at, Shirley threw out on our hundredth birthday. Aunt yeah. Shirley threw out the first pitch at uh, a Brewers game, and twenty of us got comped in for the Brewers game. And the crowd, and I know Milwaukee crowds. Um, fortunately, they hadn't had enough time to drink too much, so they were actually polite to her. That's a big beer town, and ain't she, it, Milwaukee? Oh my God! I remember as a kid going to Ten Cent Beer Night. Uh -huh. at Milwaukee County Stadium where you could watch marriages disintegrate <laughs> over <laughs> over six innings. You'd start with a, a, a couple in love, excited to be at the game, and by the seventh inning, it was like, you fucking son of a bitch. I remember driving to work in the South Bronx and uh, Yankee Stadium, this is years back, they had bat day. You know, they used to give yeah, sure. everybody a bat. <laughs> well, I'm driving to work, I see these gangs of kids, 30, 40 kids with bats, and I got the windows up, I'm locking the doors. I said, this can't be a good idea. <laughs> So let's get into show business. Okay. How do you get into show business? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, what would you say, Stephen, your, was, would be the height of your illustrious career? Okay. Or And if you can't pick one, pick one or two. The height of the illustrious career. I mean, listen, the, the Emmy run we had on Murphy was pretty amazing, but that was relatively early. Mm -hmm. I was really lucky. Gary, my writing partner, Gary Donzig, um, and I started, we met as actors and we started writing pretty late because both of us had had careers as actors. Um, so we didn't know what the odds were, which is really good um, because if we had known the odds, we might not have been so blithe about going into it, but we got lucky. It was the right time, right place. And we got on Murphy pretty quick. And so that all happened. And you got a Murphy as story editors, didn't you? We were story editors. Yes. Yeah, we were the, had the least experience, the least credit. Um, yeah, so story editors. What is a story editor? Story editor basically is the lowest level. You write, if you're lucky, you will write a script, maybe two. But generally, you're not involved in the casting of your show. You're not involved in the editing of your show. You basically hand your script in and... Um, and everybody else takes it from there. So you're an entry level writer, we pretty much. We were entry level. I mean, yeah, we had written a couple. We had been on a couple little cable shows and stuff like that, but we had very few credits. And I didn't realize that that you were at that level until I started doing research for this. Yeah. It's amazing that within four years, and Derek's got a picture of the Murphy Brown writing yeah. staff. The Murphy Brown writing staff was truly 
a hall of fame of writers. Uh, it was a great. It was it, great was, it was a great group, and you rose to be an executive producer within four years. Meteoric. Of, well, meteoric. <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to say mediocre. I was going to <laughs> cor correct you immediately, but uh, I'm a very fine B level writer. <laughs> No, that's the that's oh. the cast of Murphy Brown. That's not the writing staff of Murphy Brown. No, we don't look that. But good. look, we can we can talk about that. Look about the cast. They, Derek, I, you thought that was the writing staff. Uh, no. Yeah, that'll be the day. <laughs> which, I, one, which one is you? Uh, who else do you think? Uh, um, Miles Silverberg. No, nope, that's not the writing staff either. But oh, oh Jesus that's not Christ! The writing staff either. Wow, you found some let's great. Go, well, let's let's just go through this. That's, oh my God! That's Joni Loves Chachi. That's you as an actor. That's me as an actor. Uh, I had um, I did an, one episode of Happy Days. Where, oh, it was Happy Days. Yeah, it was Happy Days, or yeah, it was Happy Days, and um, I played basically a, an amusing version of date rape. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't do this now. You couldn't do this now. But I'm basically like chasing her around the couch, trying to comically rape her. Because <laughs> look at me. Look at me. I'm just. I'm a child. I'm wearing a madras shirt. Um. Anyway. Uh. God, I remember that episode. Um. And I've and I've forgotten some of the. I did so many little guest shots. I've forgotten some of them. Yeah, let's let's go back to the Bill Murray shot. Oh Jesus! See if we can go backwards. Yep, there's yeah, there's you and Bill. Murray. That's 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 on the square, square pegs. pegs, right? And I had worked with Bill before. Um, I had done a little bit in the movie Where the Buffalo Roam, where he played a character modeled on Hunter Thompson, mm -hmm. and um, it was a, basically an improv scene. He was in a courtroom where his friend was defending someone on a marijuana bust, and Bill had a a flask of tequila. Um, that he was drinking from, and I was a Berkeley law student observing the courtroom, and over the course of the two days, Bill gets me bombed on the tequila. And that was a that was a blast, because I'm improv with Bill Murray, um, and just basically going wherever he goes. Then Bill comes on Square Pegs, because Ann Beats had been right. one of the writers on Saturday Night and she, Live. Ann Beats recently passed away. I know, I know. A bunch of us have been... Online. This was a this was an amazing cast too. But um, Bill does this as a favor for her, and Bill plays a substitute teacher who I'm very jealous of. But there's a scene in which I have written dialogue. Bill ostensibly has written dialogue, but Bill's improving all over the place, and I'm clinging to the script <laughs> like a life like like it's it's Jack and Rose on the Titanic, and I'm trying to stay with him. It was really tough. Um, but I mean, I, I, you know, he's an amazing, amazing actor. So let's see if we can get to the Murphy Brown writing staff. He's a big Cub fan too, isn't he? Bill Murray, huge, huge Cub, Cub fan, fan. And oh, a huge he, golf fan. Yes, he is. He's both of those. See there, I was kind of cute there. Yeah. We'll just keep talking. I have no chin, but I'm cute well, enough. Right. Uh, so that Emmy run. Yeah. The Emmy run. But I would say that for sheer impact. Um, Hannah Montana was just extraordinary. Hannah Montana became a um, cultural phenomenon. A cultural phenomenon. And in some ways, the most, f it was hard because um, of the, st the stress involved with doing a kid show. Um, Michael Porius and I, who ran the show together, um, we made a wonderful writing partnership, but each of us had a personality where we banged heads a lot. And um, so there was a lot of each of us dealing with the other's personal idiosyncrasies, plus the cast, plus Miley becoming enormous, plus Disney trying to milk that cow for as much as they could, us trying to protect Miley. Um, but man, every Friday night was like a Beatles concert. Yeah. Um, well, Derek, do you, yeah. Have, do you have a picture of... Uh... Steve with Miley Cyrus. Now, this we're, of course, that's Derek Harris, the third man in the booth. Uh, his cultural bias may not let him know who Miley Cyrus is, so he may not recognize him. But Except for I have a daughter. Stephen, oh, yeah. your, your writing partner on uh, Hannah Montana was who? Was Michael Porius. So, Mike Michael and you kind of clashed. Did you find that? Better or worse than when you and Gary were writing together? Oh, no. Gary and Gary's I, the nicest man in Gary's the whole world. Gary's the nicest man in show business. And, and no, no. In the whole world. 
<laughs> well, I call him the hardest working saint in show business. <laughs> yep. um, Gary's wonderful and and lets me win most of the arguments. Do you think you get better writing out of uh, somebody no. who's adverse? Uh, no, or I, I think it's you, you get the writing you're going to get. It's just you get a lot of battles with each other. And it was it was a lot of some of it was my fault. Some of it was Michael's fault. Um, but, most of it was Michael's fault. Well. That's for others to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, could, consider me another. There's a picture of Stephen with yeah. Miley. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, when when I met Miley, she was 13 years old. She was shorter. You know, she came up to my neck. Um, and now she's taller than I am. But when she came into audition, she had, um, she had that husky southern twang. And she sang, even at... 13 she had what you call chest tones mm -hmm. she had resonance she she had power at 13 years old and she had a fearlessness that when you watched her audition she was all over the place um she would hit some jokes in an unexpected way that was hysterical she would miss some jokes by a mile but there was something about her that that we just a lot of people think the show was written for her. She was, in fact, the last person we thought was going to get it. But we kept bringing her back because there was something there that was just so visceral, so alive. that you, I said, we finally came down to Miley and one other girl, very talented young actress, much more experienced than Miley. She had been the child lead on a show with Jason Alexander. They did the... They did these two scenes. The other girl hit every joke, um, really solid, really pro. Miley, again, hitting some, missing others. But when we were all done, Gary Marsh, head of Disney, said, okay, what do we all think? And I said, the other girl's definitely more polished, more pro. And the more I watch her, the more bored I get. Yeah, that's I know remarkable. It, I know exactly what she's going to do before she does it, and then she does it, and it's fine. I can't take my eyes off Miley. I don't know what the hell she's going to do next, but when she hits it, she hits it out of the park, and I'm just watching her. Yeah. I can't take my eyes well, off. Let me ask you something. Hang on a second. Uh, you know, uh, when I worked with Howard Morris, yeah, uh, in the fifties, well, in the fifties, but in the in the eighties and nineties, Howard said she she had this. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever what whatever yeah. when an actor has this. Yes. Miley had this, and and she could sing. I love her voice. There are people who like it. There are people who don't. Her voice, it breaks my heart. And, and, and um, I just, I, when, when she's performing, when she's singing on stage, again, she's got that thing. You know she would rather die right. than this is the thing she was born to do. Yep. There's a great video uh, of Miley when she was three. I don't know. She's... She's in the barn at, her, at the, their farm in Tennessee, and she's going to jump from this area onto some hay or something. And you hear Billy off camera say, you know, careful, or, you know, be careful, honey. And she, and she says at three, I'm not afraid of anything. And she jumps. Wow. wow. That's amazing. And that's her. That's now, her. as an executive producer, I, correct me when I'm, I'm probably wrong, but you're, you're a writer. Yeah. As well as the, uh, do you decide who, who's going to be doing the casting? You're, Frank knows. The well, exec, one of the we, reasons. We've been over this maybe. This and is he a, does. 40, I know. 40, it goes over Billy's head. Episode, he's asked this, me this question <laughs> right, 45 times. But, but I know he's the head know. writer, but I'm going to ask you the question. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Please, I, I just asked the question. You, you, you haven't asked him this question before. <laughs> exactly. A lot of, if you ask writers, you know, what kind of lifestyle they would prefer. Most writers would say screenwriter because you can work in your pajamas. You can work, you work, a, you have a saner life. When you're a television writer, I don't, you know, we all talk about Carl Reiner writing the first 39 episodes of the Dick Van Dyke show. It's like, Jesus Christ, how did he do it? You're on that treadmill every week when you're doing a 24, 26 episode season. 28 when they get really big you're you're dying i mean by christmas you're you're begging for three days off uh by the you know by by march yeah, you're begging for hiatuses they're paying yeah yeah you're you're exhausted all the time you don't see your family when you see your family your mind is on what 
this week's script is okay, but what about next week? And we don't have really have a story for the week after next. And, and can we get this guest or all of that? But what you do have when you're the executive producer is as much control as as anybody short of a Scorsese has. Mm -hmm. You're the last voice. You're the last pencil. You're the last computer keystroke to touch a script. You're the one who argues with the network. Um, and the more successful you are, the more often you get to win. You're the one who, again, fights with the network but, but can win on casting. You're in the editing room with the editor making the final cuts. Um, you sacrifice lifestyle for control. And, um, St and Stephen was a good one, too, because I often say that I often, again, uh, parrot Howard Morris, but, you know, who always said a camel is a horse built by committee. Mm -hmm. And more, more shows have died because executive producers aren't willing to, to make that stand. Right. Uh, and to have a single voice. And ultimately, Stephen and Gary had a really strong voice. And that's, that's what made the show successful. But, you know, we there's so much. And you learned from Diane, of course. That's who, what I was going to say. Who had the strongest voice in the history of television. The oh. first two years of, of uh, Murphy Brown, I watched Diane. I've never seen anybody better. This I've, is Diane English. Diane English. About. I've never seen anybody better at handling all of it. Um, she could write. We used to joke. Um, her her office was um, on the way into the writer's room. All our offices at Warner Brothers were upstairs. By um, the way, I might, might add, her, their offices were in James Dean's apartment right. when he was working at Warner Brothers. Right. Because... Because Jack Warner wanted to know where and when James, <laughs> where and when James Dean was at all times. Right. So Jack Warner's office overlooked, which was at that time the pharmacy building right. at Warner Brothers, and he had James Dean in the department upstairs for the pharmacy. Yeah. Double without a cause. Huh? Yeah. So we would walk past Diane's room when we were heading into the writer's room to work, and she'd usually have her door open, and she'd be typing, working on a script. And she'd be sitting there at the typewriter with her fingers moving like Stephen Cannell. Remember Stephen? Yeah. Or Stephen the, Cannell. Yeah. He'd, at, at the, at, end, of the, at the end of the show, he'd have this thing where he'd typing and then the, the, the page flips off. And she, her fingers would be moving so fast, I'd say to Gary, she's not writing a fucking script. She's just, <laughs> she's just trying to drive us insane. But she, she was such a good writer. Um, and she also had the secret weapon of Corby Siamis, who was her right hand person, and and the two of them together were like one wonderful brain. But Diane knew how to handle the writing staff, knew how to handle the actors, knew how to handle the network, knew how to. She and and Candace bonded because when they first met each other, they were wearing they were both wearing Chanel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she just knew how to handle everything. And when we took over the show from Diane. She, we realized it took us a year to learn it. She had protected us all from so much because she was handling so much that I got into the executive producing after Diane left. Gary and I took over the show. In year four, right? In uh, fifth year. Fifth she, year. Fourth year was ended with the birth of the baby. Right. And that was Diane's 100th episode. Diane had protected us all. I thought the job of an uh, of an executive producer is to just give the cast the best scripts you possibly can. What I didn't realize is the job of an executive producer is to shield them, check in with the star, how you doing, everything okay, anything going on that we need to talk about. I didn't realize that that's as much a part of the job as as the scripts. And I, and on a lot of shows that I was on. I fulfilled that. Yes, show you did. Because you know, a lot of the executive producers didn't have the stomach to right. talk to the stars. Right. So I would be the, uh, you know, the voice of the executive producer when they wanted me to or chose right. me to. I didn't realize it took me a long time, uh, and I spent a lot of time on Hannah, dealing with Miley, dealing with Billy. Um, Billy was an interesting case because. Um, Again, the stories are now different after the fact, but the truth of the matter is Miley was the last person who was going to get that job, and it came down to that final day. And, and, um, when, and I said what I said, 
um, and um, Lee Shalachemo, who was directing the pilot, jumped in and agreed with me. Gary agreed with me, and and Gary Marsh also ultimately said, "Okay, let's go with her." Because Gary, to his credit, he said, "I want somebody who can really sing. Mm -hmm. I don't want someone that we have to produce." And um, so we went with Miley. Um, Billy had stayed out of the whole process while Miley was doing it. He he stayed in the back like a like a proud, nervous dad. But once Miley got the job. He said, do you guys mind if I audition to play the dad? And he had already done Doc up in Canada, mm -hmm. which was a mild little thing about a country doctor falls in love with a woman from, from the big city and moves to the big city. He hadn't a lot of experience. And Billy will tell you, he's not really an actor. And we thought, sure, of course you can audition. You know, it'll be cute. You know, we'll let him audition. He's not going to get it because we thought Miley is so inexperienced. We're going to need to surround her with his much experience as possible. And um, we had one guy who we thought was going to get it. And, and Billy, when he came into the room to read with her, said, um, you should probably hire that guy. He's really funny. Said, <laughs> Billy Ray Cyrus. Like nice guy. Yeah, Billy. But then he sits down with Miley to do the scene. And the love and connection between those two was so palpable and so wonderful to watch. Her comfort level with him. The physicality, the teasing, the touching, the poking. Um, it was like, it was real. You can't create that. Mm -hmm. Or if you're lucky, maybe in year two or three, you get it. These two have it from the beginning. It's going to be a great story to have Billy Ray Cyrus and his daughter playing real, you know, playing father and daughter on the show. Um, and because Billy wasn't an actor, he, he didn't fall into the normal sitcom rhythms that an actor might. Um, everybody else on the show, the kids, because of their natural proclivity and, and because the show is a Disney kids show, we always had to make sure they, they didn't fly too high above the floor, but there was a lot of fast, fast, fast. Mm -hmm. Billy couldn't go fast. So when Billy talked, everything slowed down a little bit. And frankly, it was a relief. It was a nice little change of tone. And, um, we had to convince him. At a certain point, it became almost like a star is born. He's like, what am I doing here? She's the star. You don't need me. I'm just a, I'm a joke. Um, and, and we said to him, and, and we meant it, he said, You're, you, that father-daughter relationship is the heart of this show. There are kids all over America who think you're the cool, funny dad they wish they had. Um, this show isn't the show without you. Um, and we meant it and I meant it, um, but we had to spend a lot of time making Billy feel okay, uh, as Miley's career ascended. And you probably, you know, we had, we had, a, a guest a couple of weeks ago named Bubba Gillian and uh, Bubba was Lyle in Blazing Saddles. Oh, uh, who, who started the fart scene around the fire. And he was a fireman in Dallas when, uh, Mel Brooks called him and said, will you come do this movie? And he said, I never acted before. So he turned him down like three times. And the key to him was they had to tell him, do not try to act. Yeah. You're perfect the way you are. Yeah. And, and that's a hard thing to do. And you said, it sounds like Billy Ray was the same way. Billy. Yeah. Uh, the, and the, and the more, the more relaxed it was, the more fun it was. And, and, you know, we learned how to write. We like to think. We learned how to write for all of them. Mm -hmm. Again, um, a lot of the things that came, uh, the show wasn't originally written for a particularly a Southern family, but we built in the fact that Billy had been a, a country music star. Mm -hmm. We used a lot of the real stuff, and we used certain expressions that they used. And then there were other expressions. I'm very proud of the fact I invented the phrase sweet niblets. <laughs> because as you pointed out before, I come from Wisconsin. And there's a lot of corn. A lot of corn. A lot of corn. Lot of corn. And truth is always better than fiction, I guess. You and know what? and I, then yeah. by having Miley, you were also able to have her godmother. Yeah. Dolly Parton. Uh, that was, a, I got, um, Billy and, and, and uh, Miley both said, Dolly is willing to do the show. And obviously, like everybody else, I was a huge fan of Dolly Parton's. So um, we came up with an idea, and uh, and uh, we had to. I had to call Dolly to run the idea by her because she wanted to make sure. This is 
on brand. On brand. Uh, comfortable with my image and who I who I like to project myself to be and who I really am. So we told her the story, and it was a very sweet story, and she was going to be playing the godmother, which she really is. So I tell her the story. She says, great, sounds great. I love it. I'll do it. And I said, okay, uh, Dolly, we, we're thrilled. We can't wait to see you. What uh, is there anything you need? And she said, darling, all I need is a turlet and a place to hang my wig. <laughs> <laughs> that's, and, terrific. that's perfect. That's and, down earth. Huh? And man, when she got there, I mean, the crew loved her. The cast loved her. Miley was and Billy were thrilled. Um, when she came out for her first scene, dressed, they were doing a, they had to, the episode was about getting a hold of a, of a videotape that had accidentally um, th their friend uh, uh, had uh, had accidentally shot, and if it got in the wrong hands, it would reveal her secret identity. And it was in the school um, newspaper video thing. So they had to break into the school at night to get this thing back. So they were doing a Mission Impossible thing with, with Dolly, and she was all dressed in like a black cat suit kind of thing, very form-fitting. And the Disney execs looked at Dolly, who is an architectural wonder. <laughs> and they were like, Jesus Christ! <laughs> this is the Disney Channel. This is like three dimensional. This is we can't. It's can't. It's too much. And I said, "What do you? It's Dolly Parton." They said, "You got to talk to her um, about maybe changing the clothes." And so I went up to Dolly, executive producer style. Yeah, I said, "Dolly, I want you to understand. I'm here as a messenger only. There are some people uh, over there." Who think your your outfit may be a little exuberant? <laughs> I personally have no problem with it. And she said, "Well, then, <laughs> if you don't have a problem with it, you can tell them that when you get Dolly, you get the whole package." That's great. And <laughs> That's some like, package. Oh. She'll never drown. That's and for sure. And what was fabulous was, a she was wonderful, and mm -hmm. we and we wound up having her on I think three times. Um, I got to stand during breaks uh, on the set and listen to her and Miley harmonize with Billy playing guitar. And those two voices yeah. together were fabulous. Yeah. And for Dolly, she got a whole new audience. She got kids who didn't know her at all, who became huge fans of hers. Same thing happened with Vicki Lawrence, who came on as, as Billy's mom. Mm -hmm. um, Vicki Lawrence... When she first came on, the show was a little like, I'm not sure what I got. Vicki Lauren from the Carol Burnett from Show. From the Carol Burnett Show. Vicki was, I'm not sure exactly what I got myself into, but she was fabulous with the kids. She, I remember her saying to Miley and to Emily Osment, who played her best friend, you got to learn to love your props. Use your props. Your props are your friends. Jason Earls, who played the brother, he knew it. And he instinctively knew it because Jason was the most experienced actor in the cast. But she was great with the kids. She got a whole new audience out of it. Mm -hmm. And the second and third time she came back to the show, she was like old home week. Yeah. Um, we had, there were so many wonderful moments on that show. Um, every, we would shoot part of the show on Thursday uh, because we had, in every episode, she was Miley some of the time and Hannah some of the mm -hmm. time. So we'd shoot ha all Hannah stuff on Thursday or all Miley stuff on Thursday, depending on how the script worked out. And uh, then our editor would do a rough cut of it and show it to the audience on the monitors. Well, before every show, we, when you pat when you load the audience in, we would show an, a previous episode while everything was getting ready. So the audience had something to look at. And if you had a guest star or something that was coming back, you'd show an episode where that person had been on the show just to remind the audience who it was. I would come down to the set before the show and say hi to the camera crew and uh, check out how everything was going, how everybody was doing. And I would walk and look up at the audience and I would see all these kids watching the playback of a previous episode on the monitors. And oftentimes I would see kids mouthing the, li the, the words, the dialogue of the show because they had watched the show so many times they'd memorized it. Yeah, we had that on Shake It Up with Zend yeah. Zendaya and Bella yeah. Thorne. Uh, and we had that on Girl Meets World also. The kids were phenomenal. When you're doing an adult show, even on Murphy, I mean, Murphy 
had some real impact episodes, but oftentimes, like on Suddenly Susan, you do an episode, you work really hard, you do the best you can, you're proud of it. Sometimes you're less proud, but other times you really think we did a great job. Most of the time, what you hear once it's on the air is, I saw the show last night. It was it was cute. It's cute. <laughs> it was really cute. cute. Yeah. I, I, I'll tell you one thing. That's the best you get. Yeah. I, I, I saw, we did 100 and... 14 episodes of Head of the Class from 1986 right. to 1991. I was, and I did all of them. I was watching an, a, an episode last night or the other, last week on HBO Max, and I said, was I there? Yeah. Oh, I mean, because, oh, you know, I so, forget. Yeah, you, you forget. And I was actually drawn into the story. I wanted to see what happened. <laughs> wow, that's really amazing. That's the great thing about having strokes. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so get to live it all. So Corby Shyamas has an encyclopedic memory of episodes. Who wrote what joke? I remember maybe four jokes I wrote on Murphy Brown. Now, some of the writers will tell you, well, that's because you only got four in, but that's not <laughs> true. But it's amazing how, you know, it's, I remember song lyrics mm -hmm. from when I was six years old. Of course. But I can't remember jokes that, that happened I wrote. yesterday. Yeah. And the same, yeah, and, I, and the same thing. But with Hannah Montana uh, and, and kid shows, because you know this from Disney, a kid audience is not only, they're unbelievably loyal. They're mm -hmm. passionate about it. And we would get parents saying to us, thank you for doing a show that we can watch as a family. Mm -hmm. You're, we're at a point now, we all grew up with maybe maybe two TVs in the house. There's one in the kitchen. Maybe there was one in the living room. Now everybody has their own viewing device. Everybody goes off and watches their own stuff. But we always threw in a, jokes for the adults on Hannah, mm -hmm. jokes that we knew the kids might not get this but their parents will get it. And if the parents are laughing at something, maybe the kid will say, what, why, why are you laughing? What is that? Why is that funny? And it's a conversation. Right. And the parents would say, we can watch the show with our kids. And sometimes you're dealing with bullies or sometimes you're dealing with lying to your parents and whatever, uh, being a good friend. There are good episodes, but they're not treacly. It's, it's something that, that we watch together that we can talk about. We can have a, that was wonderful. Yeah. How difficult it is for you as a, to write for 12, 13 year old girls. I mean, some of your shows, State of Grace and, uh, yeah. and Hannah Mattel. How do you do that? I mean, like, you write what you know. So, how do you feel you like J.D. Salinger to, to be able to go back in time? He challenges his inner self. I do. I, first of all, I, <laughs> he's a 12 year old about, girl at heart. You talked about <laughs> thinking I still look like I'm 20. I still remember embarrassing things from high school. I still remember embarrassing things from grade school. I'm convinced that the kids go through the same emotions adults go through. Adults just have more sophisticated names for what they're going through and more sophisticated ways of trying to deal with it. But it's the same. You want to be liked. You want to be considered smart. You want, you want someone to like you. You want over three. <laughs> We're both over three. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had a problem. I've never had a problem writing it because it's all it's all emotion. The only thing a kid has is they're less guarded about it, mm -hmm. and yeah. they're less able at times to understand what it is. So but, I can write about because I understand it. Yeah, go ahead. When did you and you or you and Gary come to the realization of that? Because you know it now, but you didn't know it then. And because when, Gary and I came out of acting. I think we were used to playing roles. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, everybody's got their own different way of writing. Gary and I, our writing method is we were two actors we met doing a play in San Diego at the Old Globe. We sat next to each other and improvised. And we'd work on, obviously, the structure, but then we'd sit at the typewriter, and we became... I, I, what I loved about writing, I missed acting when we started. But what I discovered and loved about writing is I can play Eldon Bernicke. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to play Eldon Bernicke, but I can write him and I can be him when I'm writing him and I can be Miles Silverberg. Right. And Murphy, we always, you know, Diane always said to Murphy is Mike Wallace in a dress. Mm -hmm. That was her famous quote. Well, right. So Murphy, it's funny when we first started writing the show, when we were on the show, the first four or five episodes, I remember it saying to Gary, 
how the hell are we going to do 24 of these? She's rich. She's, she's beautiful. She's respected. She's got a great job. What the hell are the problems? And then we realize it's all ego. Mm-hmm. It's all ego and insecurity. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and so Gary and I uh, never had a problem writing character because we had played characters and we loved, we loved losing ourselves in character. That's remarkable to me. Yeah. Now, when you did Murphy Brown, Murphy Brown, obviously, she was a journalist. And then when you did Suddenly Susan, she was putting down a magazine. Yeah. Is your background in journalism Harvard? <laughs> did, you have a, ha- Harvard. did you have any kind of writing journalist. background at Harvard? Harvard. 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 I, I always liked writing. I was afraid, to, I was afraid of it. I mean, uh, it's hard to do. Acting, acting is, well, they always say in, in acting, getting the job is hell. But once you get it, it's great. In writing, during the period that we were working, getting the job was easy. And once you got it, it was hell. Um, I found, um, I love good writing. I read like a maniac. I still read. I read books. I have books open all over the house. And I read good stuff. I, I can't. I can't read pot boilers. I I need language. It's I not need, how much you read; it's what I, you read. I need people who know how to use the English language, like we did. If these lips could talk, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and we, and our our latest book, <laughs> Lamar's <laughs> Gamble. Lamar's Gamble. <laughs> and then, and our, our third book is coming out combustible. I can't wait. <laughs> Good, um, but I I I loved it. But I found um, I would do. I would do everything except write when I was writing alone. I would vacuum the house. I would do laundry. I would iron. Um, I would practice my putting. Uh, <laughs> I needed someone, and that probably comes out of my acting background. I needed someone to bounce off of. And Gary and I discovered we were just similar enough and different enough to make a good writing team. Right. You know, there's an old adage that says if uh, you and your partner agree on everything, one of you is unnecessary. It's exactly right. I tried to write with a best buddy from college, and we had this exact same sense of humor, and so we got stuck at the same places. Gary and I were different enough um, that he brought things to the partnership I, I could never supply, and I did the same for him. Gary's a unique guy. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Gary? All right. Gary Donzig. Um, Gary is an incredibly spiritual, um, nurturing soul. Gary uh, grew up gay uh, and and fighting it uh, in uh, in Long Island uh, with with a father who he and I are now convinced was probably repressed homosexual. Mm-hmm. Um, his father wouldn't let them uh, didn't like them to go to the movies because he didn't like them sitting in seats that other people had sat in. <laughs> his father was incapable of going to the bathroom at somebody else's house. Um, <laughs> One of these guys that gets out of the shower with a piss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, or out of the pool. <laughs> a true gentleman. <laughs> um, <laughs> Gary had. Um, Gone to school uh, in Washington D.C. and then moved to New York to be an actor, um, and um, uh, and started working in in, in New York theater. Um, he uh, he he was adopted a little bit by the Andy Warhol crowd mm-hmm. early on. He was, as we often say, he was a beautiful young man. <laughs> um, as we as as we, our partnership developed, it was like, yeah, he's Alan Alda and I'm Radar. Uh, I was always envious because Gary was was very good looking and and still has great cheekbones to this day. Um, but uh, Gary was adopted by the Andy Warhol crowd. Um, oh, uh, that's Gary. That's Marsha Mason. Marsha Mason. Marsha mm-hmm. Mason. Lit- Marsha Mason. The good biker. That's also good Tom, biker. That's also Tom Seeley. And okay. Tom Seeley, one of our other writers. Um, uh, Marsha was married to her her first husband, um, an actor and a painter named Gary Campbell. And Gary Campbell and Gary Donzig and Marsha all lived in the same building in New York. Gary Campbell realized that he was gay. He divorced Marsha, and he and Gary became a couple. Gary and Gary. They were called the Garys. <laughs> they became a couple and and remained in a like a French film 
with with Marsha for the rest of Gary Campbell's life. The three of them were like uh, brothers and sister. When she was with uh, Neil Simon, they were often at the house for various things. When Neil and Marsha broke up, Neil was the more powerful one in the couple. So most of the friends went with Neil and Marsha found herself somewhat abandoned, not by Gary and Gary. They remained very tight to the point where where Marsha would sometimes come over and sleep sleep in the bed with the, the three of them would sleep in the bed together. <laughs> um, and ultimately, Marsha bought 50 acres in Abiquiu, New Mexico, uh, which is where Georgia O'Keefe, the painter, lived, and and sold five or 10 acres to Gary and Gary, and they built a house in Abiquiu. Um, where, wow. So they were like across the courtyard from each other. Um, and I, I think that Gary also has got a pretty good relationship with Shirley MacLaine, who he squires around town. She, they, they he's to, now, he, he, he's a male escort. Gary Campbell <laughs> died of a, uh, of a massive heart attack while Gary and I were here in L.A. And it was devastating because they were together for 37 years. And when Gary and I started writing together, it was like 1985, 86. It was just the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. Yeah. And nobody knew exactly how you got it, who was likely to get it. Could you have it for years and it was incubating and you didn't know? They had already been basically a, um, a monogamous couple for a while, um, but they didn't know. And on our very first show, Donzig would go to the hospital to visit friends who were dying before work, come in, we would write comedy. Then at lunchtime, sometimes he would go over and visit somebody in a, a nearby hospital, come back, sit on the couch, cry for 10 minutes, and then we'd write comedy. comedy. No. And we and, and it got him through and we were able to compartmentalize. But I remember those days with the two of them seeing friend after friend going and not knowing um, whether it might happen to them. Um, Campbell finally uh, died of this uh, massive coronary. Um, and eventually Gary, couldn't stay in the Abiquiu house anymore. The emo the memories were too tough. So he sold it back to Marsha and moved to Santa Fe, where he lives now. And we've been writing over Zoom. But Gary has become the dinner date of choice <laughs> for, sure, for, the for widows, um, <laughs> divorces, <laughs> Shirley McLean. He, he and Ali McGraw have become very dear friends in the last couple of years. And he says to me, he said, Allie is one of the most beautiful human beings, spiritually, everything. He said, I would almost go straight for Allie McGraw. Wow. Steve, Ty Price. Steve McQueen and Gary Donzig. Steve McQueen, Gary Donzig, and Bob Evans. And Bob Evans. Bob Evans, yeah, Bob Evans. Wow. Yeah. But he's, yeah, Gary. And the other thing, and Gary and I have talked about it a lot. Um, you, you were complimentary before about the way Gary and I ran shows. Gary was... Gary was always, we were both incredibly, um, we tried to be very, uh, we knew all the crew, we knew all the names, we, we, we let people know how much we appreciated the work they were doing, not just because that's, that's how we were brought up, but because if, if your crew knows that you're aware of the extra effort they make and you appreciate it, they're going to do it for you. Yep. Um, and, uh, so Gary was always really sweet about that. I tended to be the one who was always terrified that, you know, we're going to get found out. We're faking it. We've been faking it and faking yeah, yeah. it. This is the script where everybody finds out. And Gary was always like, we've well, figured it out before. We'll figure it out again. And I was like, no, don't you understand? <laughs> we're, be we're imposters. Because we figured it out before so many times. There's even more likelihood that this is the time. <laughs> Don't figure it out. You started as an actor. When did you know that you could write? When did you? When did it dawn on Not you? Not until Gary and I sat down together the first day, and came up with an idea, and then we started writing it, and and we thought it was funny, and um, and then friends of ours read it and said, "This is pretty good," but I still. I, I still find the process fascinating and mysterious. The one thing I've said to people is that, I was about to say before, I was the one who, who had all the fear and insecurity. I wouldn't take it out on the crew. 
I wouldn't take it out on the actors. I wouldn't take it out on the writers because I wanted to be a nice guy. I wouldn't take it out on my wife, Susan, because Frank knows her. My wife is small, but she's Irish. And, she, <laughs> and she's feisty, and, and she's you, feisty. Would, you wouldn't stand a chance. I wouldn't stand a chance, and she would kick me out on my ass. By the way, I've got the same wife. Yeah, I know. And I, I took it out on Gary. Um, I would be, because I was scared, because I was scared every week, I could be abusive towards him. Or just, I would just vent about, oh my God. Not really is, abusive. That's not. Just yeah, terrible. Yeah. I was just, oh, I, you know, this script, this sucks. We're, we suck. This is awful. This, and he would have to be the one to call me. To tell me. So I, it took me a long time to realize you waste so much time being mm -hmm. afraid. It's useless. Mm -hmm. yeah. And after 30 years of doing it, you suddenly realize, okay, I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm, I, I got to be good. I'm good. Yes. I may not be as good as I want to be. I know I'm not as good as some of the writers I admire, but I'm good. And I can get a script to a certain place. And then I've got a wonderful writing staff with me. They'll make it better. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time to get to that. Um, and now what was wonderful about doing the Murphy Brown reboot in New York was Gary and I were able to work Working. together in a way that like when we first started. And you both got separate paychecks instead of having to split a paycheck. That's right. Because as, as writers, as a writing team, right. they, as a writing entity, they pay the entity. So if the, if the, you're getting X amount of dollars, each person's getting one half X. Right. Uh, whereas now, when we were back in Murphy, we both got X. Yeah, we both got X. <laughs> but you had to check your ego at the door. I mean, when you're writing with a partner, you got to realize that it's going to be better. He's going to make it better. The more yeah. eyes on it, it's going to make absolutely. it better. Absolutely. But one of the reasons that our partnership works as well as it does is Gary lets me win most of the arguments. Uh -huh. I, and, and I have also learned that when Gary digs in his heels, it's usually, he's usually right. It's but most of the time, he will... He will say, okay, all right, yeah. Now, when you're an executive producer, your instinct comes involved in that too. I mean, like you said, yeah. with Miley Cyrus, you knew that she was the right one. You didn't yeah. know why, but you knew she was the right one. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, well, it's, of course, all you've got, I mean, writers, we've always said writers are the ones who were the loudest ones at their dinner table. But we all think we're funny. And what's, what's wonderful about writing, I missed acting for a while. Um, every once in a while, I'll go see somebody in a play, and I'll miss it all over again. And I still think, maybe I'll do a play sometime. It'd be fun. But what I loved about writing is you come up with a line, and you really think it's funny. And then you get an actor like Grant Shaw. Because Grant Grant was, I had gone up for. Grant Shaw played Miles Silverberg. He played Murphy Miles Brown. Silverberg. Grant, there's a shot of us in a book that was written called Anatomy of a Sitcom about about Murphy, where Grant and I are, are next to each other in almost identical wardrobe. Um, Grant, that was the kind of role I used to get, um, although Grant, I think, is, was far superior to what I ever would have done with it. But you, you get an actor like Grant Schott reading your material. You get an actor like Charlie Kimbrough or Candace or, or any of these guys or Joe Regobuto reading your stuff, and they make it even better than what you heard in your head. But you know when you write it, that's a funny line. And then it gets that laugh. And sometimes you write a line that you think is okay. And that line gets a huge laugh. Yeah. And then there are times when you write one, you think this is killer and it dies. But most of the time, if you're a successful writer, if you think it's funny, it's funny. Now, do you, when you write that line, do you write it with Joe Ragabuto in yes, mind? Yes. You do. You're, so you're in character. Uh, when you're that's, writing. the again, something that comes, I think, out of... Uh, being an actor, having a background as an actor. But also after hearing... You hear their voices yes, in your head. Yes, and it really takes a little while before you hear their voices, That's maybe right. a half a season or 12 That's episodes right. before you can actually write for the I still characters. remember the first big laugh, and I told you, I don't remember a lot. Um, the first big laugh I, I got, uh, I got Charlie Kimbrough because I, I heard Charlie's voice and he was reminiscing as, as uh, uh, his character. Uh, and and uh, he the line was, it was cold at the Yalu River, damn cold. <laughs> and I just knew when I came up with it, 
Charlie will kill with that line. And when you get an actor, when you get characters that are written as well as Diane wrote them and you get actors like that playing it, Charlie Kimbrough, the audience would start laughing before he'd say the line. Right. They'd start laughing as he sort of planted himself like a duck in a nest about to say the line. And it's just, it's wonderful to hear really good actors take your stuff and make it better. Well, you and Gary Donzig won an Emmy for Jingle Hell. Yeah. Was that, uh, was that the Dreidel show or was that another show? Uh, the Dreidel might have been in it. Um, that, but you, t um, you were saying before, uh, the best, you know, the best stuff comes out of life. We had, uh, a thing on, uh, like most shows, you're up, you're running, everybody's doing great. Christmas is coming. Everybody has to buy Christmas presents for everybody. It's like, ah, oh, fuck. I don't have time for this. And who needs another paperweight? Who needs another little golf ball with a with a clock in it? You know, it's like, what the hell are we doing? And so we all ran around the first year doing that on Murphy. And it was a pain in the ass. And second year, Christmas is coming. And Gary Donzig, the hardest working saint in show business, says, look, we're all doing so much better than we ever thought we would do. Why don't we, instead of buying stupid presents for each other, why don't we pick like three charities and everybody gives to the charity? And nobody has to buy presents, and everybody's. Like, By the way, that was the cruise, home run. That was the crew's hate, most hated gift. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because the crew's want the crew's wanted trinkets, <laughs> and the greatest crew, crew gift ever was Reinhold Wiggy on Night Court gave every member of the every member of the crew five hundred dollars. Well, you can give the crew stuff. That's yeah. okay. But uh, and those are those are you know ma you know those are the crew jackets or whatever. Yeah. Um, but everybody said, oh, my God, Gary, that's a great idea. We'll give to charity, and now we don't have to run around and buy stuff. Everybody's happy with it. And then Barnett Kelman, our Jewish director, sees Candace sneaking into her trailer with bags. Yeah. And then she sees her makeup artist and her hairstylist come out with the bags. <laughs> and Barnett goes into her trailer. What the hell? Did you, <laughs> you gave them she presents. Couldn't resist. You gave them presents, and she said, "I had to." They were, and he says, "How's it going to make me look?" The Jewish director. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, it was a perfect. It was a real life situation, and Gary and I created an episode about that, where everybody makes the agreement: we won't, uh, we won't buy presents. We'll give to charity, and and Murphy couldn't resist buying for a couple of people and it and you wind up at the we created the dana drug on the corner on christmas eve buying whatever's left and uh, we had corky finding charlie there with a a mouse cookie jar it was actually it, it looked too good so we had the um uh, we had the set uh, decorators um or prop guy uh, spray it gray so that it kind of looked like a rat and he's holding it, and she, and and she discovers him, and, and well, this is for you. And she says, "This is what you think of me—a rodent cookie jar." <laughs> and I have that rodent cookie jar in my office at home. Um, uh, but we went to the to the uh, drugstore over on Pass Avenue, right, and just wandered around looking at the crap that's on the shelf that you would buy at the last minute, and we had. Um, we had Corky buying, I think, for Charlie, this this Yadro kind of, pl you know, plaster thing. And it was called Two Country Boys Peeing in a Pond. <laughs> <laughs> you can't cut deals for Christmas. I, you know, my daughter is always saying, you know, my grand what, what do you, what do my grandchildren want for Christmas? Just get them two gifts, you know. And then, of course, I show up with the two gifts. And my ex-wife shows up with like 30 things and I look like a mutt. You know, it's like. <laughs> At a certain point, yeah. That's you, the way you they want to know what's happening. Yeah, that's the way they happen. I got to ask you about your Twitter handle. I got a uh, crafty lefty. Oh, yeah. Oh, five. What's that all about? Is it because you're lefty political or you're a left-hander? Uh... I'm left-handed and I'm a lefty political. And I'm... oh, five? I can't remember. It must have been when I started Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been when I started Twitter. Yeah. In oh, five. Yeah. And then, I, I, but I was in your Twitter account because uh, I was reading your son's a lot of your son's oh. blogs, and they're really good. He can write. Oh, yeah. Any background there? Did he have any training, or he just writes? Here's what happened. Genetic with my kid. First of all, he grew up on sets. He he did a couple of little uh, a little parts on on uh, Suddenly Susan, little bits. 
never wanted to be an actor, which I was thrilled with. And there was one moment, uh, he and Emily Osment were actually in the same class at, uh, at Flintridge Prep in seventh grade when Emily auditioned for us. And, uh, and, she, and I loved her audition. I came home that night and I said, we had somebody, do you know Emily? And she, oh yeah, she's in my class. What's she like? Oh, she's great. She's great. Um, and uh, I remember her, I remember she gave a great reading, but she stood there with her arms at her side and this kind of poker face. And I thought, I don't know if she really wants to be here or not, but she's giving a really great reading. And a couple days later, I was over at, uh, at the school to watch him in a, in a softball game. And Emily came running by. Um, she was chasing some other boy. Um, she was going to pound him. Uh, and, and I said, oh, you gave a really good audition. She said, oh, thanks. And she ran chasing the boy. And I thought that's, that's the girl. Mm -hmm. That's, that's who we want for the best friend. But Will was on the show and there was a period when, um, he and Miley and Emily, you know, they were seventh grade. They were like 13, 14. And then we had done the show for a year. Then there was a break for months. Miley started to blossom into a young woman and my son sprouted up and and started working out for baseball and suddenly he had shoulders and when the show came back he was on the set and Miley came up to him like Mae West and she, she was like well will you certainly filled out and he was like I got to get out of here and I was so grateful because I love Miley but she would have eaten that kid alive um but will went to uh, Loyola Marymount University here in LA he was a history major and loved history. Um, and he had turned into a good writer, mostly, he says, because I made him rewrite papers in high school because his papers were lazy. He was really good in class, but his papers were lazy. So I would say, come on. On the one hand, on the other hand, you can do, you're repeating yourself here. This is, this is filler. And he would, it drove him crazy. But by the time he got to college, he said, I, I was a really good writer. Junior year, he takes a class uh, as part of his minor. He was an English minor, and he took a class called screenwriters, screenwriting for non-screenwriters. Basically, you watch movies, talk about movies, which he loved anyway. The final assignment, there was no exam, but you had to write like a 10 to 15 page short um, screenplay. Everybody in the class apparently wrote Ingmar Bergman kind of heavy. I was raped by my uncle. <laughs> raped by my aunt, I was raped by my brother, I was raped by my dog, <laughs> just all this, you know, he wrote basically something like, um, uh, um, three, three guys wind up, uh, in, three, three buddies wind up in Tijuana, uh, can't remember how they got there, they've lost their passports, and they got to get back across the border, um, and I didn't know about this until the guy who runs the program at LMU used to be an old next door neighbor of ours called me up and he said, um, I just had dinner with the woman who um, teaches Will's class and she thinks he has real talent. And I was like, Oh crap. Uh -huh. I don't want him to do this, but I read it and it was funny. And the dialogue sounded like people really? talking and the characters were different from each other. I said, this is better than stuff I read from people who make money at it and then he said to me i think i want to try it and i was like oh crap all right and we sold one thing together it's and he's writing stuff on his own um uh, it's tough though it's tough right now and really tough uh, obviously the pandemic didn't help and even before that i've always said Gary and I started out, we were really lucky. But one of the reasons we were lucky is because when we started meeting people for writing jobs, we looked like the people who we were, who we wanted to hire us, right? We were white. We'd gone to college. We had the same comic references. We looked like their kids. They felt comfortable with us. And there were a lot of black and female writers who maybe were as good or better than us who couldn't get in the door. Well, things have swung the other way now. And my kid is exactly the wrong combination of things. Of everything. Yeah. He's going to be a, a little bit more in the back of the line now. Yeah. And, and, and it's true because I'm, I'm working at Warner yeah. Brothers again. 
and uh, it, it's, I mean, it's quite amazing what's happening, and it probably should have happened 50, right. 60, 70 exactly. years ago, exactly. but uh, there are a lot of women, a lot of blacks, a lot of Asians, a yeah. lot of minorities, everybody, it, you know, now when he was, when we were coming up, you were, had to be, you know, 80% of the writers were white males, maybe even 90% of the writers were. And a fair number were Jewish. Yes. Now it's proportionate. It's proportionate. Proportionate. And uh, as it should be. And uh, and most of me applauds it. Yeah. It's yeah. the way it should be. Yeah. It just means my kid's going to have to work a little harder. But, you if know. He's got talent. It'll, it'll come well, to the top. I, ha I believe, ultimately, if, if you're good and you keep pumping it out, yeah, it, there's room for everybody. I hope there is. I think there will be. What's and, the what's the, what's the title of his blog? How how can our viewers find his blog? Uh, it's called uh, "What's in Will's Dumb Brain," and it's on. Uh, um, uh, oh, what's in it? It's on. Uh, what, hold on. This is. I'm showing my age because I can't remember the name of the. Uh, what's the platform? It, what's on. in Will's Dumb Brain? What's in, what's Will's, in dumb, Will's Dumb Brain? Yeah, I read I a few of the blogs. Facebook. The one on fast food and failure, I really like. Both yeah, of them. really good. I know. I, and really I'm, good. I'm watching him get better as he writes it too. Well, if he wants to get better on on our website, we can publish his blogs. So okay. if he wants, if he wants us to send us a blog or yes, two, I will have him. Uh, send it. We can post it on our website because That'd be fantastic. That's great. We'd That'd love to have him. No, I, that really you, Barry. I'm not. You don't have to pay me for today. <laughs> you, you okay, great. That. Well, I'll, we'll pay him the same amount for his blog. That's fantastic. As we're long paying, as he'll take a pay, check. Will he take a check you. for me? That's no problem. As long as he'll take a check. That's great. <laughs> also on your uh, Twitter, you got writer and terrible guitarist. Obviously, oh, you're, my uh, God. You're learning to play guitar, though. Aren't you? you got to be... I stopped. I don't oh. have to start again. I got to... I love guitar playing. Yeah. I love good guitar. I love blues guitar. I love I B.B. Love King and Stevie Ray Vaughan and Albert King and Eric Clapton, and my favorite guitarist. Tom Petty. Oh, I love Tom. I miss Tom every day. I miss Tom Petty. Mike Campbell, his guitar is fabulous. But my famous favorite guitarist of all is Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits, right. who's had an extraordinary solo career as well. I find him unbelievably skilled and melodic and emotional. Um, so I know what good guitar playing sounds like. I started playing basically at after 60 years old. Well, your your hand-eye coordination, you're not as fast. It takes forever to something to imprint on your brain. I played, I played diligently for a year and I thought, I'm never going to get anywhere. And I quit. And now I want to go back and, and, and start working on it again. You know, doctors say that's the greatest thing you can do. It's great for your brain. Great. Yeah. It creates yeah. new synapses. That's it's right. The best thing you can do. Learn something new. And exercise. Yeah, the yeah. Two best things you can do. And both of those things I do. And I, I do. I love, I listen to music every day. Well, I had a long history of like abusing drugs and alcohol. I mean, I was born in Ireland, you know, William Patrick, Michael O'Connor. Uh, it was almost a, you know, an ethic responsibility to be a drug. I owned a few bars. Oh, uh, I was a bookmaker, you know, I was yeah. a fireman in the Bronx and Harlem. So, I mean, it was always plenty of, plenty of liquid, yeah. plenty of oil and, uh, <laughs> yeah, plenty of oil. But, uh, I found that, you know, when I went back to school at the age, at 68, 68 when I graduated, That's fair. I started doing stand-up, and uh, my mind was missing, you know, like, things yeah. that I thought I could just grab, like, yeah. you know, when you reach for names that you know, and you say, well, what's that guy's name again? And you say, Jesus, I used to know that, you know. We were talking Cole. about Jeopardy before. Yeah. yeah. Five years ago, I was like, Susan and Will were both saying, when are you going to apply? When are you going to apply? Now. There are nights when I knew it five minutes ago. Yeah. I'll know it five minutes from now. I don't know it now. It's in that file cabinet. I see the file cabinet in my mind. I can't open. I can't unlock the file cabinet. It's right in there. Yeah. But but definitely, I, I would definitely go back if I was you. Keep playing the guitar. It doesn't make I'm any difference. It doesn't make any difference whether you're no, good. It's, you ain't I, never going to be Tom Petty. But right. you know who is? Who is Tom Petty? And Tom Petty, by the way, is a Gainesville guy. You know, he came yeah, from yeah. Gainesville. Well, the UF. What, what was a Gainesville, Gainesville guy. guy. Yeah. Uh, I like to do things in the present tense, Frank. So, you, know? there, you got that over here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. uh, uh, before we go, I want to I get this in because we got to 
a favorite episode of mine of Suddenly Susan. Okay. I th- I know which one it is. <laughs> I'm in the room, dear. Can <laughs> Still you, in uh, the room. Put, can you put up the photo of Brooke Shields as a, as a young blonde? She, you know who she is? Uh, we Do got, I know who Brooke Shields is? Yeah. Uh, so, so there's a picture of Steve <laughs> and Gary with Brooke Shields, Harvey Corman, Harvey Corman and Tim Conway, and Rosemary. And Rosemary. So why don't you tell us about how that episode came about? Uh, there there they is. are. There it is. And just keep the picture this up. This is one of the most fun episodes of television I've ever been involved in. Um, I'm not sure where the first impetus came. It might have been our, our mutual friend, Greg Itson. Right. Greg was in the same play in San Diego that Gary and I met doing. Greg Itson, who played the evil president in in the Kiefer Sutherland show 24, uh, a wonderful actor. He had done a show with Harvey, and and was a golf buddy of Harvey's. And I think and I played with him and Harvey out at Balboa or someplace. Anyway, um, I'm not sure where the initial impulse came from, but we came up with an idea for a show where Susan, played by Brooke, is walking on her way to work every day, walks by this old folks' home, and she sees this sad little, this guy, this little man, sitting all alone, staring out the window. And it's he seems so sad, and she decides, I'm going to go make friends with him. And it's Tim Conway, who is incredibly bitter. <laughs> bitter, mean, <laughs> cranky. And he's bitter and mean because his brother, stole the girl that he loved years ago and broke his heart and he's never seen or spoken to his brother or the girl again. If you look at these three, it it chronologically makes no sense at all. (laughs) But we got Tim and we got Harvey to play the brother and Rosemary to play the woman. And of course, when she brings the brothers together, uh, Tim discovers that Harvey's life with Rosemary has been a living hell for 30, 35, 40 years. Um, and the, the three of them were, during the week, an absolute joy to work with, right? I found every excuse to be on that stage every minute. Me, of wow, we well, loved it. We loved it. And then when we were getting ready to film, I suddenly had this fear like, oh, shit, our audience is younger. What if they don't recognize them? What if they don't know who they are? They walk. They Tim came out for his first entrance. They went nuts. Everyone, they killed in every scene. The audience loved it. There was one moment where Rosemary had to make an entrance. And she was in her little director's chair off set. And she looked to all the world like she was either dead <laughs> or very deeply asleep. And the stage manager was like, Rosemary, Rosemary, you're on. And she bolted out of that chair like a racehorse from from zero to 60 and was on that stage not missing a beat. They were fabulous. Pros. They were absolutely fabulous. Every scene they were in. And man, what a treat to work with people that you grew up as a kid watching I on know. TV. Oh, and, that's got to be so laughing kick. until you cried. Um, then the flip side of that would be the Tony Curtis episode. Well, before we get to Tony Curtis, uh, I want to say that... Uh, Probably ten years ago. Maybe, oh, right. Maybe fifteen years after the shooting, I was at a, a birthday party for Don Rickles, and I was sitting right next to Harvey Corman, and I introduced myself, and he, I said, I said, I'm Frank Pace, I produced Suddenly Susan. He goes, still in the room, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so, what did you tell about it? What was that line? Oh, there was, there was a line where, um, where uh, Tim's in the room. And Harvey and Rosemary and Tim says something about uh, about how much he loved her and basically she's saying that Har- that Harvey you know Harvey's an idiot he's a loser this was the worst mistake I ever made in my life he's pathetic and Harvey goes still in the room <laughs> oh it's great I love that line about you when the uh, turns out that the guy's life was a living hell there's an oh. old an old shot of a, an Irishman, I guess about 84, 85 year old pensioner, and he's weeping in front of his gravestone. He's, why did you die? I was so happy. Why did you die? And two kids are walking past and they say, oh, who is that? And he goes, 
That's my wife's first husband. <laughs> Why? <laughs> so now your Tony Curtis story. Oh God, we we came up with it. I don't know. I think we may have been approached by his management or something, but we found out Tony was interested in doing a sitcom. We thought, wow, this is fabulous. And we had uh, the wonderful Barbara Berry mm-hmm. as as Brooks' grandmother, and so we came up with a story where she meets this older gentleman and starts a romance late in life only to discover when she goes shopping for clothes with Brooke that he's a cross dresser. He comes out of the dressing room next to her. And it's of course an homage to some like it hot. Um, Tony comes to the set and it becomes clear to us almost immediately that he spent a little bit too much time in Plato in the grotto (laughs) At, uh, at, at Hugh Hefner's. At Hugh Hefner's. He can't remember. He can't get through a line. And we were going to film in front of an audience. So we realized by Tuesday, we're going to have to get this without an audience. We filmed him shot by shot. Mm-hmm. Um, it was intensely difficult. And at one point, and I mean, I'm, I was a huge fan. Of course. Um, and I, again, after years of acting, I was like, I can talk to actors, you know, a lot of people, a lot of writers can't, but I'm, I'm, I'm of the tribe. So I know how to talk to actors. So I went up to Tony. There was a scene where he comes over to apologize to Barbara after having been caught wearing the clothes and he's trying to explain, it's just this thing I do, whatever. And, um, and he was being, he he was, it was too easy. He was being too glib. So I said, um, Tony, when you get to the door and she, and you see her, you're not exactly sure how you're, you know, you, you really feel m- more awkward. You don't know exactly how to say it. You don't know whether she'll accept the apology a little bit more. And he said, you want me to pause? Yeah, I, I, I'd i like you to pause. He said, how long do you want? Do you want a one pause? Do you want a two pause? Do you want a three pause? Two. <laughs> All right, I'll give I'll, I'll give you a two pause. And I thought, oh, crap. <laughs> this is a guy who some like it hot. I well, mean, of course, Jesus Christ, so good. And it's like, I'll give you a a number two, <laughs> the fire one. Said. Well, uh, you know, and we called his agent afterward and said, you are not doing this guy any favors. Do not let him anywhere near. Well, s- sitcoms. It, you know, it reminds me of a, a line of Peter O'Toole had in my favorite year when he said. I'm not an actor. I'm a movie star. That's because it. in movies, yeah. you have to learn maybe one page of dialogue a day. Right. Maximum two. Right. In a sitcom, you have to learn 45 pages right. of dialogue Every, and deliver it at a moment's notice. And then throw it out, and the next week, 45 new pages. Yep. Candace and on Murphy, uh, Diane believed in speeches. I mean, we had speeches for Candace that were could be a page long. And for a long time, she memorized them all, and no, and she made it look so easy. You didn't realize what it was taking out of her. Oh, the effort must be a remarkable. Did they do the cue cards? But she tried. Finally, not- no. At the after a while, she she said, "I I got I need help," and it was like, "Sure, okay, of course, why not?" But up until for a while, and Gary and I wrote an episode, the the episode where Miles worries that he might be gay. Mm-hmm. Uh, because he uh, also based on on something that happened in the writers' room, a dream that one of the writers had, but um, it was the first episode in three years, maybe, in which Murphy was not in every scene of the show. She was so that character was so predominant that Candace. Most shows have an A and a B story. Sure. So there, you get a break. Candace was in every scene of every show for the first two and a half, three years. It's enormous. She worked her ass off. She worked her ass off. She, she's, you know, one of the hardest working women I've ever met. And her success is yeah. very well earned. Yeah. No accident. Uh, it's 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 well earned. It's it's not deserved. It's well earned. Yeah. Uh, and even when I went back, when we went back yeah. in 2018, she was incredibly prepared and incredibly gracious. And she is uh, she's, she's a, the delight of delights. She's a pro. The crews loved her. Yep. She uh, salty, funny, raunchy at times. Yeah, she's everything you would not expect Candace right. Bergen to be. Right. She was she was like 
one of the guys. She's like, yeah, she's like a Carol Lombard. She's yep. a guy's gal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Billy Carol would Lombard. call him a dame. A yeah, dame. A she's great, a real dame. A great bro. Best sense of the word. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of pros in that picture. I can't oh, tell you that. Yeah. There's some real pros in that yeah. picture. Yeah. Well, to wrap this up, Derek, do you have any questions you want to add? Stephen, Billy, do you have any questions? I got a couple questions. What, what's the industry has changed a lot? I'm yeah. sure since you've uh, yeah. you started. Um, what What do you think like the top two biggest changes are? I, I know Netflix and the streaming yeah. services, but uh, there's there's two two changes. One of them is good. And one of them uh, I don't think is quite as good. Uh, there's a lot more avenues for opportunities for for writers and actors now. You can you can create something. Most most agents don't know how, uh, and 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 a lot of execs don't know how to read a script, mm. so they can't tell sometimes if it's funny. I remember an exec at Warner Brothers. We walked out of a table reading one day, and he said, "Boy, that was that went really well." I said, "Yeah, it's a good script." He said, "It's funny. I read it over the weekends, and sometimes I don't think it's funny." And then I hear it at the table on Monday, and it's really funny. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I, I, I walked away thinking, Jesus Christ, this guy's a comedy VP. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. So there's a lot of there's a lot more avenues. You can create something. You can create a ten minute short or a fifteen minute short as a writer. Get your actor friends to do it, and somebody can see it because an agent or an exec is much more likely to watch a ten or fifteen minute thing than they are to read a 45 page script. Mm. And they'll also be able to tell if it's funny. So that's a good thing. One of the things I think is not as good is I don't think people are brought up through the ranks the way we were to learn what makes a good script and what makes a good script better. I remember Diane cutting a joke of ours that I thought was really funny and I said, well, that's a really funny joke. She said, it is. It's a very funny joke, but it's a joke at the wrong time. Uh, and I was like, I don't understand. <laughs> Any joke that works is at the right. Pl and she was like, no, sometimes it hurts the build. It gets in the way. Even a diamond into flow, it interferes with the flow of the stream. It, it Tell the story. With the flow. And, and or the it's diamond. the wrong kind of funny for this moment. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand that either. I think some people get launched really quick and um and they don't have enough arrows in the quiver yet right mm -hmm. so that's a problem yeah and i had i actually that was a one of my questions was how come so much bad stuff gets made so i guess that answers that i question. think i think that is it but there's such a need for material right i right. also know now from trying to sell stuff that powers being uh, uh, even though there's a lot of avenues, power is being sort of concentrated in, in fewer and fewer big conglomerates. And there's more looking for the sure thing. Right. Yeah. So that means I don't care how good this is. If it doesn't have a face attached to it, or if it doesn't come from somebody's book that's well known, you're much less likely to get original material. So you're getting a lot of stuff that is like the eighth version of, Fast and Furious, King you know, Kong versus right. Godzilla is yeah. being made again. I mean, I mean I, I've Rocky seen, Thirty Five. How many times can I see yeah. Tokyo or New York or yeah. L.A. blown up? I, yeah. I like a, I still like a small character movie. Yeah, yeah I do too. I tell you, uh, Derek, I'll answer uh, Stephen's question from my standpoint. Yeah. Uh, five years ago, ten years ago, we couldn't produce this show, right? Because this show. This podcast would cost a hundred thousand dollars to do. Now we could do it with our cell phones. Yeah. And uh, if uh, you know, anytime a young person comes to me and says, "How do I get into the business?" I said, "Well, if you if you got a short, if you got a movie, you've got, went to school, you've got friends, make your own movie. You know, it's it's the old Andy Hardy." Let's get together and, yeah. and let's, let's, <laughs> my let's, dad's let's, got a barn. Let's my bar, dad's exactly. got a barn. You got talent. Let's put on a show. Right. Let's put on a show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can edit it on your phone. You can uh, yeah. score it on your phone. Uh, that's the quickest way to get into I agree. business. I heard somebody say that the computing power in my phone is more sophisticated than what was in the rocket that Alan Shepard went up in. Without a doubt. Yes. And uh, my my good friend David Scott. Who was on? A, who was the 
commander of Apollo 15, the first person to drive on the moon, he said exactly that. He said, our cell phones now have got a thousand times more capability Jeez. than the computers that put us on the moon. Wow. And there's more scientists alive today than ever lived. So yep. God knows what's going to happen in the next 20 years. It's going to be an interesting I mean, ride. we've seen some changes in our lives. I mean, really. Some... My mom's 98. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and as sharp as a tack. She wants to stay alive long enough to try and vote Ron Johnson out in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm all for it. <laughs> Billy, any closing questions? <laughs> no, really. Just to, to, that I really enjoyed talking to you, man. It was oh, a remarkable okay. talking to you. I, uh, and, you know, as, as a writer, or alleged writer anyway, uh, I love to pick the brains of writers. And uh, I'm delighted that your son's I love, I love being a writer. I love it. I love hanging out with writers. It's been one of the joys of my life. I had dinner with uh, Russ Woody and Tom Palmer. Oh, how are they doing? Um, they're doing They're doing great. Uh, they were writers on the Murphy staff. Writers on the Murphy staff. All, they become foxhole buddies. Uh, yep. People that you did a show with are, are, your, are your war buddies. Mm -hmm. And you know about each other's families. You know each other's histories. Well, you're problems. with them like 40 or 50 hours a week, You're with right? them more than you're more with than your that. family. Yeah. More than 40 or 50 yeah. hours. Yeah. 60 to 70 hours. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Stephen, thank you so much. Oh, I mean, this, you, you know. You've it's been a blast. A, it's you've a been blast. a delight. You guys did great research. And, uh, and some of these photos I haven't seen. You know, I, I never saw the, the Happy Days thing. Yeah. Well, well, we got a Brett Favre uh, dick pic we could put up for you, too, if yeah, you want. <laughs> see, only if he's wearing the Crocs. <laughs> Little Brett, I think he called it. <laughs> well, th thank you so much for being here. You've been a terrific thank you, guest. And uh, I look forward to seeing you and Susan soon. Sounds great. All right. Thank thanks. You. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Eric. Pretty good guest, huh, pal? Oh, yeah. He was interesting as hell, man. Really interesting guy. And th again, back to what you said, what we said in the lips is what I got from you was being flexible. I mean, uh. I started out as an actor and ended up as a writer and then as an executive producer. Yeah. Most uh, actors who, who have some success younger in life uh, realize they are not going to be able to make a living as an actor forever. So they start writing. They start directing. And that's how you have so many actors become directors. Throw more pans in the fire. Just uh, I told you the story about Steve Buscemi when the, uh, when he was a fireman in Manhattan, the captain told him, you know, Steve, you're not that good looking, you know, <laughs> and you're leaving a good job. You should really consider, reconsider this. And, uh, you know, you got to, like you said, you got to stay alive. Well, Pepe, when we had Pepe Castro on, it's the same thing. I mean, uh, he wrote jingles. You do whatever you got to do to stay alive, to, mm -hmm. keep, to keep, and you're still working. You do what you love to do. It's like Larry Wilmore told me once, it's about all, well, it's, it's about alternate sources of income. You have to get all kinds of alternate sources of income. Streams, of income, streams yeah. of income. Yeah, yeah. And that makes sense, which uh, I've never been able to do. I've had streams of outcome. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you can spend it as quick as you get it. Oh, I, can, I got tons of streams of outcome. The income thing is a problem. Uh, what, there's a great line in Dickens, David Copperfield, where, where McCorv is telling David Copperfield, young Mr. Copperfield, uh, there's expenditures. And there's income. And, you know, if your expenditures act out, out do your income, you've got problems, you know. And that's, that's been a problem all my life, right? Yeah. I had, a, I had a college professor once whose philosophy on life was, he says, you make a little, you, make, you wait till the pile goes up, and then you spend it all. <laughs> that's <laughs> not a bad philosophy. And then you make it up again, <laughs> and then you spend it all. Mm -hmm. And he died broke. Yeah, was yeah but yeah. you know what? Is that a bad way to die? Die no, broke? I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it is a bad way to die. You think so? Why? Yeah. You commit to the world screaming naked and broke. Why not go out the same way? Because you should be able to make something of your life in the time in between. Ah, yeah. but is but is it but is economics the measure of what you've accomplished in life? No, know? but you can you can you can you can't you can't you can't time your death is the real issue. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. you can't you can't time when you run out of the money. That's the problem. No, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah I, I get that. Well, you can. <laughs> If you've well, been you broke can. all your life, <laughs> you, you can time it. it yeah, that's true. You could, you you could, could jump could. off the bridge because you haven't had money for so long. I'm going to end it all. You, could you know, I got to tell you the, the, the story, uh, the, my Tony Curtis story. And and uh, Stephen said it uh, on the way out the door. But the way I heard the story was that Bertie Schwartz, Tony Curtis, was roommates with Walter Matta. Right. When they both came to New York, and both of them, of course, were struggling actors, so they were roommates. 
But, of course, with the Bronx tradition and New York tradition of breaking each other's balls, uh, Curtis made it big with Some Like It Hot, of course. That was his big breakthrough role. And he was in the back of a limousine driving by Penn Station, and Walter Matthau was trying to hail a cab, and it was pouring rain. I mean, hissing out of the heavens, rain. And uh, Tony Curtis sees Walter Matthau, and he tells the chauffeur, pull over, pull over, it's my friend Walter. And he puts down the window, he goes, Walter, Walter. And Walter Matthau goes, Tony, thank God. He goes, I can't get a cab. He goes, I just fucked Mal on my road. He puts the window <laughs> up and pulls off. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like typical Bronx, typical New York. You know what? So, I'm not going to do anything else I had planned. Say goodnight. Bill. Say goodnight. Bill. <laughs> <laughs> goodnight I didn't fuck my alibi. It was Bernie Schwartz. Say goodnight, Bill. Good night, good night. Good night, thanks, thanks for looking in. Don't forget if these lips can talk. Uh, keep an eye out for Lamar's Gamble. Yeah, well, Lamar's Gamble is going to be out really soon. It might, may already be out. Yeah, well, I'm looking for check the mailbox today. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. Let's hope we get a copy of it. Yeah. I know a guy if you need one. Okay. <laughs> Good night, Derek. Good night, Derek. Good night, everybody. Good night, America. Next week's Good guest, night. former professional baseball player Doug Flynn.